I'm very lucky to be joined by Phil Walker-Harding. Phil, thanks for coming. And how is uh, PAX going for you so far? Uh, pretty good. Pretty good. Actually, this is my first day. So I actually haven't been in PAX yet, fully. But so far, so good. No complaints. <laughs> That's good to hear. The reason uh, we're here and the reason you're at PAX is to show off your new game. Can you tell me about it? Yeah, so my new game is called Spellbook. Uh, it's out from Space Cowboys. And it's like a cool, s simple set collection game uh, inspired by Rummy. Um, but what I wanted to do is make a kind of Rummy game where every time you make a meld of a color, you earn a special ability for the rest of the game. So you're basically learning these cool spells uh, which power up your ability to draw and swap and learn again and do different things like that. And just having a look at the game, uh, it does seem like, well, not only is it like a fun game, there's a bit of a race element to it of like, do you power up the spells to be more powerful for the rest of the game or are you trying to rush through to finish the game and like block other people out? It also has some uh, very good, very cool components. Yeah, so um, Space Cowboys, the publisher, did an amazing job with the artwork. They turned what were originally pretty boring looking cards into these great acrylic magic tokens, which are the main way you, you spend in the game. So that was really cool. And yeah, in the game you can only learn each spell once, because you know that's how life works. Yep. And when you learn it, uh, you've got to choose to learn it at level 3, 4 or 5, based on how many tokens you spend. So, do you save up to try and get it super powerful, or do you just learn it at the lowest level, so you have access to the power now, but it might not be quite as strong. So that's a big choice in the game, yeah. Looking at that game and looking at some, many of the other games you designed, I think you have a real talent for just sort of instilling game mechanics and mechanisms down to, or not to their core, but like they're easy to learn, but there's enough there for gamers to really engage with it and, and keep you hooked. Uh, is that something you're sort of aiming for consciously? Yeah, you've just described my whole, you know, philosophy of game design basically. Like starting with Sushi Go, um, which is probably my most well-known game, I got really excited about finding fun mechanisms that I enjoy and just focusing on them for the whole like design space. And then with kind of two reasons. One is to help like new players get excited about easy to learn games and to sort of showcase these different mechanisms. But also I just really enjoy that idea of using a game to explore one idea really deeply. So with Spellbook, it's really just, you know, making sets of colored cards. Like that's what excited me. And then I wanted to really dig into that design space and and yeah, as you say, make it something gamers will, will be interested in, but also something you can play with very casual gamers as well. Um, and in Spellbook, there's actually levels of spells which are kind of different difficulties. So when you first play it at level one, it's a pretty, you could play with kids. You know, it's quite an easy teach. But once you get up to the other levels, there's a few more options to think about. The powers and start working together. In those yeah, levels. there's a few synergies, there's a few tricks to find, um, and hopefully gamers will enjoy exploring that. Yeah. Does that mean with that design philosophy that we're never going to see like a Phil Walker Harding like 4X or like a massive train game or other big legacy game? So I do like, like I still, I enjoy playing more complex games, but um, for some reason my brain won't make one. So I've tried actually, I've tried, I really want to make like a, one of my design goals is to make like your stock standard 90 minute complex Euro game. Just to give that a go. Like that's a design space that I just feel so foreign to me, but I just want to see if I can do it. But every time I've tried, I end up with a 20 minute filler game. So my brain has a way of cutting off all the excess until there's only a, a short game left, but oh well. Well, you have done some collaborations and co-designs. Uh, you're in Australia, Martin Wallace is in Australia. Maybe that's, uh, that's an avenue. And he, he does complex well. Yeah. He does do complex well, yeah. And, and Matthew Dunstan's now moved back to Australia, which is cool. So there's some really great designers in our country, for sure. Having had success with Sushi Go and, and worked with a lot of different companies, how have you seen the sort of um, the industry sort of grow and change in the last couple of years? Yeah, it's interesting. There's been a lot of changes. So I was like, I think people will be talking about before COVID and after COVID in the board game space, because even just as a designer, who was not on the forefront of like, I guess the business side of the industry. I just felt this seismic shift <laughs> during COVID about how many people were ordering games to play, playing them at home uh, with their partner or with their family. And um, that's one of the biggest shifts is I think in the last five years here, um, I just hear random people 
on the street talking about <laughs> Ticket to Ride and Carcassonne and Catan. They're in Kmart now. I mean, that's something that I wasn't sure would quite ever happen in Australia, but it has. We've kind of ticked over into that kind of accessibility to some of those more hobby titles. So that's probably the biggest change I've seen in the last few years. Um, but also, um, I mean, we could talk for hours about how the industry's changed, but that's the biggest one I noticed, because when I first got into board games, you know, 15, 20 years ago, um, I felt like a bit of a strange duck, you know? Like, not many people knew about these games from Germany. And um, most people had a weird response to the hobby, as if it was something that only existed in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and who plays games anymore? But that's all changed, which is so exciting. It's interesting to talk about, obviously, uh, so department stores and like Target and Kmart in Australia are a little bit different to some of the American um, brands, just in terms of the scope. But you have designed and released games that are like Target exclusives that are aimed at that market that for many people, Sushi Go or Summer Camp could be the introduction to hobby games. How does that feel to be in that same sort of breadth of those big games that you were talking about before, like Catan and Carcassonne? Yeah, so when I first started designing, the thought of being in Target in the States would just have been an impossible thought. But a few publishers over there uh, in the States have teamed up with places like Target and offer them exclusive deals. So like Summer Camp, for example, um, was a Target exclusive for a short while and is now more widely available. But it's a really interesting space to design into because Target is looking for games that, one, are going to be instantly appealing off the shelf. So you kind of have to have a very mass market mindset. But at the same time, they understand, I think, that this hobby has grown to the point now where even just random people buying games at Target expect a game to actually deliver in gameplay and give you something more interesting that you're going to come back to again and again. So um, Summer Camp's a great example where I wanted to bring deck building down to that kind of mass market space and sort of say, um, people might get into this game because of the artwork or the title or the nostalgia for the theme, but when they get it home, they might discover this cool mechanism that gamers have been enjoying for a while. So yeah, it's a really interesting space to design into. I guess also that it's interesting because, yes, often some of those more sort of welcome plus games or welcome game, welcoming games are sort of seen as like, oh, you start here and then you can go up. But like some of those games, like I've been into gaming for a while, I'll always go back to Sushi Go for drafting. Oh, like this and other games like that are like, you don't need to jump past it. They don't need to be the hurdle that you, you bounce off, so to speak. That's right. I think a lot of, like most gamers in the world who you know, don't use Board Game Geek and totally obsess over the hobby, most of them are quite conscious, uh, not that conscious about, oh, you know, am I progressing in difficulty in the games I play? They just play what they like. And um, I, I admit I'm a bit like that too. Like, I like a lot of really simple, like, I think um, this idea that, you know, you start with Sushi Go and then you go to Seven Wonders and then you go to the next game. I mean, that's cool if, you're, if you want to explore strategy deeper and deeper and deeper. But... I think a lot of what makes board gaming a cool hobby is that um, games can be played habitually, like for your whole life. You could play um, a card game with your parents every week for 10 years. And I think there's something really cool about that repetition and games kind of seeping into culture a little bit. And so I think there's something really cool about designing a really accessible game that just stays with people and they keep playing it for a long time, rather than this idea that, oh, you leave that behind for the next thing. Um, I mean, that's fun too, to kind of explore. Uh, but I think there's all sorts of different types of gamers out there. Yeah, yeah I don't, you don't need to embrace the cult in you unless, of course, you want to buy a spell book, which then you should which embrace you must, it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which you must embrace. Um, no, but I do... Seri I mean, I often think... People sometimes ask me what my goals are in game design. And I think one of them, which feel, sounds really pompous... But one of them is to design a game that people are playing in 100 years. You know what I mean? Like, just a game that... Um, and I'll never know that, obviously, because I'll be dead. But a game that um, enters the culture a little bit. Because, um, like, if you think about the games you learned growing up, you probably don't even remember being taught them or how many times you played them. They were just always there, you know? And you have all these fond memories playing them with friends and family. And that's something board games bring to entertainment that nothing else really does like video games kind of come and go and get um and new consoles come out and things become obsolete and movies 
you know, certain things become classics, but technology and taste changes so much. But there's something about games that can just kind of sit and stay for hundreds of years, which is which is what excites me the most, I think. Mm. It's definitely a fun hobby. And Phil, thank you very much for taking the time to have a chat about Spellbook and also generally game design and, and your excellent career. Thank you very much. Thank you.